So um, good morning, everybody. My name is um, Peter Susco. I am a coach at Calvert Hall College High School. Um, previously before that, I coached um, a college team at George Mason for a number of years. And then I debated at the small school in Virginia called um, University of Mary Washington. And then I debated at the school called Cathedral Prep in um, Erie, Pennsylvania. I have had most of my debate career has been in small schools with limited resources. Um, let's see, for some reason, all right, is that, are we, am I able to admit that person? Hopefully, yep, yeah. cool. Um, so most of my debate career has been limited resources. When I was in high school, there was eight people on our team. Um, we finished second for the Baker that year. And then when I was in college, there was anywhere between four to six people on my, on my team. So Fiat has been something that has been very, very useful for me debating from a small school. And um, a lot of times in a, in a season, um, you're, you don't have case nags um, to start the year. So a lot of times there are certain years where um, you start the year and um, you don't have a key case nag until November, until December. And fiat helps a lot of those things. It uh, goes and um, is an equalizer for a lot of them. So this lecture is not so much on like what is fiat and the different ways you can argue fiat. It's more like how abusive can you be with fiat and what you can use and kind of tools you can have in the event that you don't have a case neg, in the event that you don't have advantage answers, in the event that you get popped on something, how can you fiat away something so that you can still win a debate? So I'm gonna talk about different things, different components. Um, for me as a lecturer, this is just gonna be, I'm just gonna throw a word up there and then um, there's not gonna be like definitions or anything. Uh, this is gonna be recorded. I can share you this PowerPoint, um, but I would just jot down a few things as I go from slide to slide. So we're gonna talk about um, the hits today. We're gonna to talk about fiat in the pre-round. We're gonna talk about agents, Fed key warrants, certainty, fiating away advantages, uniqueness, planks, picks, when to stop, and am I a god? So let's get started. With that, um, you should incorporate fiat into your pre-round ch checklist. So when you go into a round, right, you um, get it, uh, you walk in, they tell you the AF, they say it's on the wiki, they say it's uh, whatever on the wiki, and then you have to go find it. And then you start, you know, looking at your case neg and then taking into account what your arguments are. What critique do you have? What topicality arguments can you make? Do you have a, do you have a specific pick? Do you have a specific counter plan, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So, this is from a perspective of a few things, all right? The conversation we're gonna have is um, all predicated on who is your judge, all right? Who is your judge, Jesus? Um, who is your judge? And what's their opinion on conditionality? Most judges are fine with conditionality, all right? Um, there are some judges like myself and a few other of your lab leaders that are very, 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 very neg leaning on conditionality, but typically you can find that out in their judge philosophy. All right. So you want to know how much of the dish, all right, how much fiat can you get away with right off the start? The second thing you should be doing, all right, after you look at the judge, all right, is compare the 1AC to your case neg. If you have one, if you have a case neg, that's great. If you don't, all right, and this happens a lot. I mean, this happened a lot on the CGR topic. It's gonna happen a lot on the water topic. You're gonna walk into a round and you're gonna be like, that's an F or that is something that I did not prepare or maybe some jv -er put that case neg together where they just literally cycled a camp file and it has, it has nothing highlighted, there's nothing specific. So there are a lot of times you're gonna be like, I don't have the goods. Maybe it's an advantage, maybe it's a new solvency mechanism, et cetera. So, after you do those things, one, check the dish. Two, check and see your case neg. Take a list of your offense, all right? What arguments do you have? What arguments do you have that apply, right? What DAs do you have? Do you have politics links? Do you have a topic DA? Do you have an industry DA? Um, what are their advantages? Going through the list of what their advantages are, counterplans case. So all of this stuff is very, very basic, all right? But these are all things you have to do when you're thinking about fiat 
in a debate. So there's a, a lot of preparation that goes into fiat. And then lastly, all right, and this is something hugely, hugely important. You want to be reading your affirmative, the affirmative's evidence. You want to be reading the affirmative's evidence. And that is a crucial part of the research process, of the fiat process, because you want to be seeing uh, if there is something that you can fiat away. So that's something that you can do instead of, you know, um, going and hanging out with somebody or just chilling 10 minutes before. You can, you know, very chilly, just uh, read some EV, see if they have some arguments. And I'll, I'll talk about that in a little bit more detail about why reading FF before round is hugely important and reading EV FF during the 1AC is hugely important. So you have a pre-round ch checklist. These are things that you should always, always be doing and are essential if you're going to fiat away all of your problems. So with that being the case, all right, these are all gonna be things that you should think about and files that you should have. Um, some of them will be very easy to produce um, because every camp will have them. Some of them you might have to put a little bit of work in or you're gonna have to decide if you want to be debating from that option, okay? But you can basically auto win a debate through fiat just by winning a few, uh, a few easy parts of a debate, all right? A lot of the things I'm gonna tell you are no duh, you've done them all, but this is a checklist so that you can, if you don't have a case neg, if you don't have the goods on the affirmative, you can still win a debate. So the first one is agent, all right? Obviously you can read an agent counter plan, all right? Um, there's the classic, uh, you just, if they say US federal government, you read an agent specification and then you uh, read an agent counter plan. So uh, most affirmatives are going to be Congress on this topic as they usually are. So you'll have the ability to um, read an executive counter plan. You'll have the ability to read a court's counter plan. There will be different contexts, but if you don't have an, an answer to an advantage, right? All you have to do is establish competition for an agent counter plan. That's all you have to do. So you can completely get rid of all the advantages that they worked weeks and weeks on that were built to answer specific disadvantages by getting to an executive or a courts or a Congress counter plan, what have you. So fiat can easily get you into a debate. Let me let uh, Brian in. Um, fiat can easily get you into a debate and can easily win you a debate with an agent counter plan. You should have some like baseline of a court's counter plan, some baseline of an executive counter plan before your first tournament in September. The next one is Fed key, all right? Uh, your generics, you made the state's counter plan. This is also no duh. Obviously you're gonna have a state's counter plan. If they cannot defend that they have a Fed key warrant to their advantage, um, it's over. And you can kind of fiat away um, any of their Fed key warrants in order to win a debate. So at minimum, having an executive or courts counter plan, you're obviously gonna have a state's counter plan. Fiat is allowed, it allows you to get outside of this, all right? Now these are also, and we're gonna to get to the third one, very crucial and very useful things to do when you're debating a soft left affirmative as well, where they've got four minutes of framing, they've got like two minutes of thumpers to all of your offense. This is what gets you back into the game with a Fed key warrant um, in a state's counter plan or courts or the executive counter plan. All of these are hugely, hugely, hugely beneficial. So a state's counter plan to check their Fed key warrant. The next one is certainty. Okay, certainty. So um, some of you might have some um, experience with process counter plans um, and the only real solvency deficit um, based off the affirmative is a certainty key argument that the affirmative has to be unconditional. It has to be certain. It has to happen and people have to perceive it as not changing whatsoever in order to access the advantage. If they don't have that argument, it's over. It's absolutely over. And you can read a process counter plan and easily win a debate because they don't have a solvency deficit to your counter plan. So for example, um, the NGA counter plan, which is that threading counter plan where the governors last year would threaten um, to, you know, they would threaten cooperation with the federal government if they didn't do the plan and then Congress would do the plan. All of that 
um, there was a level of uncertainty because the, the federal government could say no to the threat in. Um, so really the only defense that an affirmative would have against that, granted they would you know still have solvency deficits to NGA and say no, et cetera, et cetera. But really the only deficit they have is certainty. So you can look at the advantage um, internal link work, you can look at the solvency work, and if they don't have a certainty key argument, it's over. It's oh, you can you can go for your process counter plan, beat back the permutation relatively easily, and then you can easily win a debate. Process counter plans are that's that's three steps right there. If they and these are things that you're doing as you're checking the one AC, you check to see their Congress key or card. If their Congress key card is trash you can go for an agent counter plan. You check their Fed key argument. If their Fed key argument is trash, you go for a state's counter plan. If you, have, if you look at their certainty cards and they don't even have certainty cards, or if their certainty cards are absolutely terrible, then you go for a process counter plan. It can be NGA, it can be some consult, it can be some regulation process counter plan. It really doesn't matter. But going into the year, you should have those options because there will be times there'll be times where you don't have a case neg. So for example, um, my sophomore year of college um, was a nuclear weapons topic. And it was a topic to change nuclear weapons policy, get rid of nuclear weapons, change nuclear weapons postures, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And there was this big affirmative called no first use. It was the biggest affirmative on the topic. And we just didn't have a case neg to it. We didn't have a case neg to the, it, it's like ha not having a case neg to death penalty going into the, into the season. We didn't have a case neg to um, no first use and until like the third month of the year. So what we did was we just read a process counter plan, went for politics in case if that didn't work out and were able to relatively easily roll people because they didn't have a lot of certainty key arguments that were good enough to beat the process counter plan that we were reading on that topic. So a lot of this can sustain you early in the season when you don't have a case neg when you're catching up, if you're a small team or even if you're a big team too. And you know those three off case positions, process an agent counter plan, states counter plan, process counter plan, that's like two minutes, 90 seconds, maybe 230. And you can easily stretch out a two AC with all of those. So these are like kind of the no duh arguments. The, the other ones, um, maybe you haven't really thought about, um, but we're, we're, gonna, we're gonna keep rolling. And um, we'll do questions at the very end after we um, finish the lecture. So with that being the case, um, fiat away advantages. Fiat away advantages. Solvency evidence is trash. What might I mean by solvency evidence is trash? Mm. Okay. Most of the time, solvency evidence will have like 10 proposals and the app will just highlight one and be like, that's what they're talking about. 100%, 100%, Charlotte. Um, I mean, you all, cut a one, you all cut one ACs last week, right? You see the evidence that they're, they're talking about, right? It'll be uh, a law review journal. It'll be a think tank. And it'll be like, here's five options. And the option that they hi highlighted is like three paragraphs. And then you go three paragraphs down, three paragraphs above, all right? A lot of people, when they're writing, also take both sides. So a lot of times it'll be a solvency deficit that's right after it. So often, even in the cards themselves sometimes, because you know there's not really perfect cards out there, you'll see a option of something to fiat away. So when, um, you have an advantage that uh, they don't really have, you have no answers to, you have no game, um, you haven't even looked at the case nag. That's something you can do pre-round. That's something you can do when they're breaking advantages. The other thing too, okay, is at this point, um, advantage counter plans are a thing, right? If there is an advantage, if there is a, if they have some tricky component to a warming advantage, People read warming advantages on CGR. They read it on arm sales. Um, I guess you don't, you weren't, if you were debating immigration, you, you know, weren't really doing advantage counter plans. Um, it's, a, it's a thing, right? You can advantage counter plan out of whatever advantage they're reading. 
if they're reading an AI advantage, if they're reading an econ advantage, you can literally um, read advantage counterpoint out of it, get into a debate about how their internal links to that advantage are trash, or you just overwhelm them and then just impact turn the other advantage. So if there's an advantage that you um, have, the, if there's an impact turn that you, that, that's your thing, that you're jonesing for, it, right? If you are a DDEV person, um, if you have, um, a huge hedge bad file uh, from, from some other topic. I won't get into like all the different impact turns, but it's easily an option for you and you can easily get out of it by uh, just reading a ton of planks to an advantage counter plan, right? A lot of times when you're reading an advantage counter plan, you have to worry about um, linking to the net benefit and net benefits are typically politics. But when you're trying to be as abus abusive as possible, and you've got the goods on an impact turn and they are unfortunate enough to read that in front of you, you can spend a minute, a minute and a half maybe on an advantage counter plan, read a bunch of planks, obviously over, over, over solve something, right? Read like five planks to warming, to solve warming and then impact turn the economy. In that world, right? You are absolutely putting them on their heels you are putting them in an awful, awful spot because even if the 2AC can respond and you know go card for card, they're going to get buried in the neg block and then the 1AR is not going to have enough time. So a lot of times what you can do is you can advantage counterplan out of it and then impact turn something that you have the goods on, all right? If you are not an impact turn debater, um, you know I would encourage you to try and take a look at some impact turn at some point this season because a lot of times, um, you're not going to be able to catch up with all the internal link work that people are having. So being able to just kind of meet them at the end and be like, nah, we're, we're good. Impact turn can easily allow you to fiat away advantages. So moving on, um, uniqueness. Okay. Can you fiat away uniqueness? Um, there's this coach at Harvard. He runs, I don't know if you've ever heard of the website Bashard Debate. Um, but he used to be obsessed with this idea of um, putting politics disadvantages that had no uniqueness and then reading them. So he would like uh, propose putting law of the sea treaty on the docket and then reading a law of the sea treaty good. So he, he had this, he, he was uh, not obsessed, but he really liked the idea of just reading the same politics DA that was never going to pass over and over and over again. Um, but if, if somebody has the goods on a uniqueness argument, you can fiat it out. Um, if you know it's coming beforehand, if there's some argument that is a, a slayer to your disadvantage, you can uniqueness counterplan out of it. Um, if you only have like, so like last year, um, for example, there was really no DAs. You only had criminal, you only had the politics DA in elections earlier on in the year. So if somebody had the goods on a uniqueness argument that would, absolutely demolish your DA, then you're done. You're dead in the water. Um, you have T or you have some process counter plan. Maybe you have um, a critique that's also in play, but you know, the bread and butter of a politics counter plan debate, if the uniqueness question's done, you're done. So you can also 2NC counter plan to get out of uniqueness questions. Um, again, going back to the first slide, you wanna be checking your judge philosophy. Some judges are uncomfortable with 2NC counter plans. Um, the AF certainly of the winnable trash AF theory arguments, it's probably the closest one that people can get to when there's also multiple conditional arguments. But if you don't get your, if, if, if you allow it to slide, your DA is dead. So you feel free to unique this counter plan to get out of certain things in order for your DA to um, be sustained. Now, you should always do the stuff in the 2NC. Um, a lot of people, I, I don't really know a lot of people that would allow people to fiat in the 1NR. I mean, some people um, don't even like people reading EV in the 1NR, um, like some debate fossils, but uh, you should typically you a 2NC uniqueness counter plan in obviously the 2NC. Blanks. So this is a strategy that Michigan State um, was really, really, really um, big on and has proliferated um, to a certain extent on the 
on, at high school, but you can read a multi-plane counter plan and you can throw just ridiculous planks in there. Um, sometimes they don't even need solvency evidence because a rule of thumb when you're fiatting stuff is if they, you can, it's their job to prevent you from getting to it. So if you want to try and fiat away an advantage, and if they don't say anything, the advantage is gone. And um, that can be by um, allocating funds. So something, something that I used to do in high school um, when I would debate like a funding F is I would, um, it's a little obnoxious, but I would, um, I had this counter plan that would uh, drain the rainy day fund from Connecticut. I don't know why I picked Connecticut, but I saw that Connecticut had like a $5 billion rainy day fund. So I would just siphon it and then throw it into the plan. And, you know, there was no cards to a rainy day fund from Connecticut. And I'd throw that in as a plank and then that would completely go away. It was extremely, extremely abusive, but um, it was their job to try and push back on that. So you can throw planks in. There are a lot of times and a lot of debaters that it'll get lost in a shuffle. So a 2A will see five planks in a counter plan and they won't be able to answer every specific one because you're reading five, seven, eight off and you're reading a, a multi-plane counter plan. The only caveat is a lot of times the judge also is not falling at the same level. So it does require some level of extra explanation in the 2NC that an executive counter plan, that a process counter plan, states, et cetera, doesn't need. So it does make the counter plan explanation in the 2NC and 2NR the burden higher, but you have the ability to slip things in. Like um, I've, I've seen people do ch uh, China won't go to war to fiat out of a, a China war scenario that they don't have the goods on and to see if they can get away with it. But you can have planks that are added, right? You can have your planks um, on a state's counter plan. You can have your planks on an incentives counter plan. Um, you can have your planks on a agent or process counter plan when we get to that. Um, they're something that can, if you get away with it, debate's over. If, if they push back on it, that's completely fine too. So picks, all right. Float them. Um, I will add the caveat that um, I primarily coach policy teams. Um, I had like a few K teams when I coached in college, but I didn't um, do a lot of argument analysis with them. But um, my kind of take on critiques is you want to do, um, my teams all have this file called Ks on Ks, which are just like extra Ks that you throw into the 2NC, extra framing arguments that you throw into the 2NC. I mean, I unfortunately, um, a few of my novices used to schlog in the 2NC to win some um, novice tournaments. But um, the same type of reasoning is um, applicable when you have floating picks. So, you know, a floating pick is a pick that does the affirmative and it solves for the entirety of the affirmative. Uh, you should never admit it in a 1NC, but you should apply it or strongly <laughs> encourage it in the 2NC and then just flat out state it in the 2NR. Um, a lot of times uh, people are not going to um, vote on floating picks bad. If you win conditionality, um, you'll probably be, you'll probably be fine. It's just an argument that if they don't answer in the one AR, uh, you can basically auto win a debate if your alternative is doing the entirety of the affirmative. And let's be honest, people are really bad at alt defense debating. It's like the last thing people put in their two AC. So a lot of times you can get away with murder when you have a pick. Uh, really depends on what critique you're reading and what type of um, impact you have to your critique if you have like a big stick impact or if you just have a framing impact it really depends but you can definitely fiat away an affirmative by reading a critique so um with that all right when to stop and am i a god object to what so the rule of thumb when you're fiatting stuff is fiat as much as you can and then you'll kind of know when to back off. So you can throw stuff out there and if they push back on it, that's completely fine. Otherwise you auto win a debate. So for example, I debated an affirmative um, when I was in college, my freshman year of college, and they read this affirmative, this God affirmative, that God is real. 
and that um, this one affirmative was a sin and they were solving for it. So I um, didn't have a case neg. My Nietzsche file wasn't highlighted. I had a politics disadvantage. So um, I was stuck and I just did some God fiat and had God ban hell. And then I was able to get away with it because it was so ridiculous. And they thought um, they forgot to permit in the 1AR. Um, they, they read some like weird fiat argument that wasn't even God fiat is bad. And I was able to get away with it. So a lot of times um, when you're thinking about an argument, okay, as long as you look at the judge and you have seen their philosophy, you know what their interpretation is on fiat, try and get away with as much as humanly possible. A really um, not well-kept secret about like debate right now is you can get away with pretty much any fiat because of the critique. Um, because there's the critique is so prevalent, people are basically letting two ends get away with murder when it comes to fiat, when it comes to pushing, pushing the boundaries. So you all should do that and see and put them on their toes. At minimum, if you do that, you're stretching them out and then you can go for a more legitimate position. So you always have the ability to try and fiat different advantages, try to fiat different um, solvency mechanisms to put yourself back in the game. So when to stop, you'll know when to stop, but uh, you can always kind of push the bounds with that. So um, with that, okay, um, I believe we're at the question time. So I'm going to stop my share, okay, and then I'm going to stop the recording.